When the Euroleague MVP joined the NBA this summer, fans had massive expectations. And rightfully so. At 2022 Eurobasket, Sasha Vizhenkov averaged more points than Nikola Jokic, more rebounds than Yanis Antetokounmpo and had better shooting stats than Luka Doncic. He averaged 28 points and 12.5 rebounds for the tournament. He was outperforming the NBA's very best players. But what did he do after that? He became the best player in Euroleague. Sasha Vizhenkov had a historic season at Olympiakos. He led the Euroleague in scoring. He was MVP of the Euroleague and would have been a Euroleague champion if not for this crazy ending in the finals. Ewing working against foul, beats him with the dribble, pulls up at the elbow. Mallorcan oh! James, good! And Sergio Ewing gives Real Madrid a one point lead! NBA fans expected huge things from Vizhenkov, and that's because at the time of his signing, Europeans were taking over the sport. The NBA's finals MVP was European, the number one pick in the draft was European, the world champions of the FIBA World Cup were European. So it was easy for Kings fans to get carried away when they heard they'd signed the best player in Europe. Because there was no reason to believe his game wouldn't translate to the NBA. And yet here we are, halfway through the NBA season, and Vizhenkov is averaging 5.7 points and 2.6 rebounds per game. Euroleague fans cannot understand why Vizhenkov hasn't been successful so far. Some people will say it's because he's not a number one option. But that shouldn't be a problem. Even in Euroleague, Vizhenkov was a low usage player. He famously scored 24 points without a single dribble. He's never needed the ball to score. He is 6'9 with one of the quickest releases in basketball. So getting his shot off isn't a problem. Making his shots has never been a problem either. This will sound like a fake stat. Vizhenkov averaged an insane 10.3 points per dribble last season in the Euroleague. Vizhenkov is one of the best shooters in the world. Don't believe me? Hear it from De'Aaron Fox. One of, our, one of our shooting drills I think is like 150 shots and I think he missed 7. Like, like he's up there with some of the best shooters in the world. Kings fans had tipped Vizhenkov to beat Keegan Murray's rookie season 3 point record. But so far, he's absolutely miles off it. In Europe, Vizhenkov wasn't just a catch and shooter. He scored a lot of his points inside the arc. He shot 66% on two pointers in his MVP season, most of which were well timed cuts as a result of his off ball movement. You would think in the Kings' offense, playing alongside Sabonis, one of the best passing big men, where teams are so focused on De'Aaron Fox, that Vizhenkov would get some of the easiest looks of his career. It hasn't happened like that. But why? The most obvious reason is playing time. Vizhenkov is yet to start a game for the Kings. He plays an average of 12 minutes a night and has DNP'd 9 times this season. He has only played 20 minutes or more 3 times. He really hasn't had a chance to properly break into the Kings rotation, his playing time is inconsistent, and his role is yet to be properly established. A big reason for that is something we've not talked about yet. Defense. Despite having one of the best defensive ratings in Euroleague, Vizhenkov has admitted himself in interviews, it's not been an easy adjustment. Uh, I'll never be a lockdown defender, let's be honest, but um, I want to be solid. Obviously, Vizhenkov has limitations defensively, he moves slow laterally and is often targeted on that side of the ball. But that's not to say he's a bad defender. On this play, when matched up against LeBron James, Vizhenkov held his own. Here's a clip of Sasha matched up against Mike James, one of the greatest guards in Euroleague known for his back. And I think he did a pretty good job. Guarding the best guard in Euroleague is one thing, but guarding the best NBA guard is another. But Vizhenkov proved he can do that too. Trying to dribble out of it, Curry gets a step on Sabonis, it's blocked by Vizhenkov! He's improving and is making up for his lack of defensive attributes with high IQ and hustle. Sasha will never be a great individual defender, but he can be a good team defender, and he'll need to continue being that to get more playing time on the floor. The NBA's coach of the year just doesn't fully trust Vizhenkov yet, and truthfully, he prefers other guys. The Kings starting power forward is Keegan Murray. He was the 4th pick in the 2022 NBA draft and broke the rookie record for most 3 pointers in a season. Keegan Murray is the starting power forward and that's not going to change anytime soon. 
The starting small forward, Harrison Barnes, is a 12-year vet, NBA champion, has started pretty much every year his whole career, been a solid pro, is consistent on both ends, and a career 38% three-point shooter. He's been in Sacramento for six years now, he's established, but has reached a point in his career where he's now regressing. Which means there could be an opportunity for someone to take his place in the starting lineup. At the same time though, when you consider the fact the Kings had their best season in over a decade with this lineup, switching it up is a big call. The Kings are the fifth seed and above 500. It's one of those where it could work better, but it also isn't broke. So are they going to try and fix it? Who knows? But Vizhenkov doesn't need to be starting to have a major role with this team. There are bench players across the NBA playing starter minutes. For example, Bilal Koulibaly is logging 27 minutes a night and has only started twice this season. The real person stopping Vizhenko from getting on the floor is Trey Lyles. He's playing 20 minutes a night, averaging 6.9 points and 4.6 rebounds. The production isn't anything special, and when you compare stats per 100 possessions, Vizhenkov clears. Per 36 minutes, Vizhenkov clears. So why does Mike Brown choose to play Trey Lyles over Sasha Vizhenkov? Lyles is more athletic, he can do more off the dribble, at times he plays the stretch 5, which makes him an interchangeable fit with Sabonis who also likes to play the 4. Another thing playing in Lyles' favour is his chemistry with Fox. When on the court together they score 125 points per 100 possessions, while giving up just 103 points per 100 possessions. The bottom line is, De'Aaron Fox is the franchise player, if you play well alongside him, you're gonna play. Which is sad because it means we get to see less of the great chemistry that Sabonis and Sasha have together. The pair have the European connection, they see the game the same way, and with Sabonis on the court, sometimes it's as simple as a dribble handoff. That's a climb. The problem is that defensively, Mike Brown doesn't like the front court pairing of Sasha and Sabonis. Understandably so, the rim protection is non-existent, they average less than a block per game combined. So usually when Vizhenkov is at the 4, Sabonis is on the bench and McGee's at the 5. For that reason they don't share the court together as much as they should, unless Sasha is at the 3. Obviously as one of the stars of the team, Sabonis is on the court the majority of the time. So what's the main thing Sasha Vizhenkov needs to do to play more for the Kings? In my opinion, it's pretty simple. He needs to shoot better. Right now Vizhenkov is shooting 37% from the 3 point line, which is around league average. But Vizhenkov isn't a league average shooter, he is one of the best shooters in the world. And yet there are currently 8 players on the Sacramento Kings alone that shoot a higher percentage than Sasha. Two of them are Trey Lyles and Harrison Barnes, two of Sasha's biggest competitors for playing time. The Kings want spacing and players that can stretch the floor. Trey Lyles and Barnes are doing that just as well as Sasha, but are also bringing more to the table defensively. So what Sasha needs to do is continue to improve his all-around game, as he has been, but he also needs to shoot a considerably higher percentage from the perimeter than those guys. Over the last four years in Euroleague, Vizhenkov shot 41%. You'd think that with more spacing and easier looks, he should be able to do that in the NBA too. I also think Vizhenkov is suffering a bit from shooter syndrome, there's so much more to his game than just being a spot up shooter. But in the NBA he's unproven and considered a specialist. So far in the NBA he's kind of been limited to that and when you're considered a specialist, you're expected to come into the game cold after warming the bench all night and hit all your shots at a ridiculously high percentage. That puts extra pressure on the shooter. Anytime they get a good look they have to make it because they don't know when or if they're going to get another chance. I think even a lot of Kings fans will agree that Vizhenkov's skill set is being criminally underutilised in the NBA. And I don't think we'll see the best of Vizhenkov until the playoffs. The Kings are a young team, they're very inexperienced. Vizhenkov is a guy who's played high pressure meaningful basketball his entire career, and when the game slows down and things get serious and you need high IQ players capable of producing when it counts, Vizhenkov is a guy the Kings will be able to depend on. It's no secret that the Kings are trying to make a move, they want a forward after missing out on Pascal Siakam, so in the event a trade does happen, Vizhenkov may be part of that deal because of his contract. I guess we'll have to find out. But Sasha Vizhenkov wasn't the only Euroleague MVP that came to the NBA last summer. No. 
is another. When I say Sasha Vizhenkov was the best player in EuroLeague, fans are quick to say, what about Vasily Micic? And that's because when the two matched up against each other in the final four of EuroLeague, this happened. Micic keeps the ball in his hands. Clock is running out. Micic rises. If it goes, he'll win it! <laughs> Vasily Micic! You know we could have easily made these two separate videos and doubled the views, but I'm not here to waste your time, so subscribe to the channel. See the guy that hit that shot? That's Vasily Micic, a Serbian point guard that was drafted in 2014 and is only just coming to the NBA now at 30 years old. That's crazy, because Nikola Jokic has been trying to get the Nuggets to sign him for years. The duo were both drafted in 2014, they played for the same club in Serbia and have gone on to have incredible careers in basketball. But some crazy and Serbian hoops fans will tell you Vasily Micic is actually the best Serbian basketball player. That's probably because Jokic isn't too popular back home, because last summer, instead of helping his country win the FIBA World Cup final, he was more interested in horse racing. Vasily Micic's CV in EuroLeague speaks for itself. He was EuroLeague MVP in 2021, and unlike Vizhenkov, he won the EuroLeague championship. Not once, but twice. He led the EuroLeague in scoring in 2022, he has two EuroLeague Final Four MVPs, as well as being the finals top scorer twice. Unfortunately for Micic, who you were in EuroLeague means nothing when you come to the NBA. If you arrive in the States thinking you're somebody because of what you did in Europe, you will quickly realise to them you're a nobody. And that's what's happened to Micic since joining the OKC Thunder last summer. When asked if he had any assurances about playing time when coming over, he said this. Perhaps he should have had some assurances, because he's barely playing at all. Micic has played 27 of a possible 48 games. 21 times he has DNP'd, he's played 20 minutes or more just one time and he's averaging just under 12 minutes a night. Unlike Vizhenkov, Micic is a guy who needs the ball in his hands. In EuroLeague in his second MVP season, he had a usage rate of 27.5%. It was justified because he led the league in scoring with 18.2 points per game and averaged almost 5 assists. Don't let the inflated American stats deceive you, that's a lot of assists, especially in EuroLeague. He's a way better passer than that stat suggests. But going from having the ball in your hands all game to playing in OKC and not getting many touches is a hard adjustment to make. That's why when you see the numbers, you'd think he's failing, averaging 3.5 points per game and 2.4 assists. But those numbers are understandable given his minutes. What isn't good is how he has some of the worst shooting efficiency on the team. He's shooting 25% from the perimeter, and Micic admitted that the new three-point line will take some time to get used to. Unlike Vizhenkov, Micic can't shoot over defenders with a quick release. It was always going to be hard for him to come over and shoot like he did in EuroLeague. It's been hard for him to do anything, actually, because his usage rate in OKC is 15.6%. He doesn't have the ball nearly as much as he'd like to, and the reason for that is because he plays for a great team. The OKC Thunder are one of the top seeds in the Western Conference, and they aren't short of ball handlers. Shea Gellius Alexander is an MVP candidate, he dominates the ball. You also have Josh Giddy as a secondary playmaker. Jalen Williams isn't a guard, but he's averaging almost 5 assists per game. Pretty much everyone on the OKC Thunder can handle the ball, heck even their centres, Chet Holmgren and Pokusevsky, they're big men and they can put the ball on the floor as well. Expecting Micic to be a starter for the Thunder is unrealistic. Even the most optimistic EuroLeague fans looked at this fit and thought best case scenario, he's the sixth man. He ain't ever starting over Shea, he ain't starting over Giddy either. But even off the bench, look who he's competing with. Kaysen Wallace, 10th pick in the 2023 NBA Draft. He's a rookie and he's contributing already. Wallace is shooting 42% from the three point line and 51% from the field. He's only averaging 7 a game, but he's doing it on 63% true shooting. He's a rookie and far from a finished product, his role with this team is only going to get bigger. There's also Isaiah Joe, he's logging just under 20 minutes a night. Likewise, he's a young player, ready to go. He's giving you 8.6 points per game, he's shooting almost 43% from the 3 point line, also 63% true shooting. He's 23 years old, it's safe to say he's going nowhere. The Thunder are actually so deep that Trey Mann gets no burn. This is a first round pick who showed a lot of promise in his first two years. He went from playing 22 minutes a game as a rookie 
to 9 minutes a game this season. And it's not because he isn't good enough, it's because they've got so many good players. Because of this, Vasily Micic doesn't get on the court very often either, and when he does, he doesn't get the ball as much as he needs to be effective. So what does he need to do? More of what he did the other night. The Thunder defeated the defending champions and Micic had the best game of his NBA career so far. He scored a career high 12 points, he had 5 assists and 2 rebounds. He did this in only 17 minutes of playing time. This type of performance is what we need to see from Micic in the NBA. He should be the backup point guard that leads the second unit when Shai is out of the game. They don't need him to be a scorer, they've got enough scoring. They need a veteran that can keep everyone involved and make the right plays. Micic averages the most assists per 100 possessions on the Thunder. This is a young team that has zero playoff experience. In the postseason, they are going to need a guy like Micic who knows the stakes and understands pressure. He's played in the Olympics, FIBA, all over Europe. Considering the fact that the Thunder are the second youngest team in the NBA with an average age of 23 and a half years old, perhaps the Thunder will need Micic more than the Kings are gonna need Sasha. Because if basketball history is anything to base it off, a lot of these young guys that are getting off right now in the regular season, their bubble will be bust in the playoffs. In those type of games, experience outranks everything. The Thunder don't have many vets. Micic is the second oldest player on the team and he's a 30 year old rookie. Never mind, the Thunder have just traded Vasily Micic to the Hornets. He'll be stuck backing up Lamelo in Charlotte and definitely won't be seeing the playoffs anytime soon. See, this right here is why a lot of EuroLeague players don't want to play in the NBA. Imagine you're winning championships, MVPs, you're in a great situation. An NBA team is begging you to come over for years and within a few months of being over there, you're getting traded. To Charlotte of all places. You go from one of the best to one of the worst NBA teams overnight. Now I'm going to ask some questions I don't have the answer for. I made a video where I talked about every EuroLeague MVP that played in the NBA and pretty much all of them had the same story. They were role players who never really got a chance to be anything more than that, got frustrated with their situations and ended up leaving and returning to Europe. There's obviously an adaptation period for EuroLeague players coming over to the NBA just like any player coming into the NBA. The only players that hit the ground running right away in the NBA are lottery picks who are given every opportunity to do so. When you compare Luka and Micic's MVP seasons, you can see that the numbers are very similar. They both won MVP, they both won the championship. Interestingly enough, the same concerns scouts had about Micic they had for Luka. They said he'd be too slow, unathletic, wasn't a good enough shooter and won't be able to finish or get his shots off. Realistically speaking, how much did Luka Doncic really improve in one summer? He didn't even play summer league, yet came into the NBA dominant from day one and averaged 21-7-7 seven seven his rookie season. I just want to know what would happen if an NBA team treated somebody like Vasily Micic like a real rookie, as if he was 20 years old and gave him the treatment of a lottery pick. Like Luca, where you're the number one option from day one, it's your team and you have the green light to play your game. I'm willing to bet under those circumstances, Vasily Micic would be a lot better than what we're seeing right now in OKC. And the same applies to Sasha Vizhenkov. We've seen what he's capable of against NBA players. He was outperforming NBA MVPs at Eurobasket. Nikola Jokic, Yanis Antetokounmpo. Vizhenkov was right up there with those guys. So you mean to tell me Vizhenkov is one of the best players at FIBA, he's MVP of the Euroleague, but in the NBA he's a role player? If Sasha and Micic had their MVP seasons when they were young like Luka and they had the exact same skill sets as they do today, they'd be top 5 picks and given the keys to a franchise. How different would their NBA careers look like right now under those circumstances? I'd be so interested to know what would happen if an NBA team in the lottery signed the EuroLeague MVP and treated him like the number one pick. They built their entire team around him and allowed him to be the same guy in the NBA that he was in the EuroLeague. What would happen? We don't know and we probably never will know because it's an experiment that no NBA team is brave enough to try. No GM is going to risk their career building around an older, unproven international player, no matter what they accomplish overseas. I understand that NBA and international basketball are a lot different. Different rules, different courts, different styles. But at the end of the day, hoops is hoops. You have a ball, a shot clock and 10 players on the court. 
and I don't think you can be as good as Giannis, Jokic and Luka in FIBA and then come over to the NBA and you're getting benched for Trey Lyles. A guy who couldn't play at the level of those guys under any circumstances imaginable. Damn. So how are you going to tell me he's a better player than Vizhenkov? All of that is more far-fetched to me than believing that your league players just aren't good enough for the NBA. And nobody can tell me otherwise. Listen, I know you've not made it this far in the video and don't have your own opinion. So let me know down below in the comment section. I also need to know how many of you guys play 2k. If so, I need viewers to play with, we're making a comeback on Twitch, link is down below in the description. If you're not interested in gaming, why not watch another video? If you like this one, I'm sure you'll like those as well. And on that note, it's DKM signing out, until next time, and peace.